Susan, welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And for those of you who, who don't know me, I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here at SAMA. And before we start, just a few brief announcements. Um, as always, if you could please silence your cell phone if you've not done that yet, we'd be appreciative. I want to mention that tonight's conversation is sponsored by the Askin Fund, and we're very grateful for that support. And the exhibition, The Missing Piece, runs through July 31st, and I want to acknowledge the sponsors of the exhibition, the Sue E. Denman Exhibition Endowment, the Helen and Everett H. Jones Exhibition Endowment, uh, Claudia and David Ladenson, SAMA Contemporaries, and many of you are members, thank you for your support, the Marsha and Otto Kaler Foundation, Dr. Jane Appleby, and the Alice Clayberg Reynolds Foundation. Also, I want to remind you that you uh, still are welcome, if you have not done so, to contribute to the Monitor Peace Project, which is playing on the monitors in the galleries and on the SAMA website, where you can upload messages of peace and images of peace. We'd love to have you contribute to that. And don't forget that we also have a virtual tour of the exhibition that you can take on our website or from your mobile phone. A couple of important dates for upcoming events. Uh, we have uh, two artist conversations that will be happening in July, uh, following the tradition of our first artist conversations when Contemporary Art Month was in July. We continue that uh, with conversations with artists in the SAMA collection. And on July 5th, I'll be interviewing Trish Simonite here at 6.30 p.m. And on July 19th, my guest will be Gary Sweeney. Also, if you missed the conversation with William T. Wiley, which um, was the first one we did in conjunction with The Missing Piece, it is now available to be seen on YouTube along with other uh, videos from our previous conversations. Just type San Antonio Museum of Art into the, uh, the window, the search engine on YouTube. So now we're going to focus on the art of Susan Plum, who is one of the artists in the current exhibition. And Susan's had a very interesting life, which uh, goes back to Mexico City. So while we look at this image of this landmark in Mexico City, let's begin by telling us about your early life and why this landmark is important. Uh, this landmark is important because it seemed to be all roads lead to the Angel. And I always thought that was somewhat uh, mystical. As a young, as, as a, a child, you know, I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Um, it was also in 1957, I just, I was quite young, and um, that was one of the earthquakes that I experienced there, and the Angel fell. And, um, but they retrieved it and uh, restored it and put it back up again. So that was memorable in, for me. Um, but the street Reforma is to me a very special street. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's got a lot of history. So that's one of the reasons, you know. There's some personal elements as well as Were you making art when elements. you were a child? Huh? Were you making art when you were a child? Yes, as much as I was allowed to, yeah. <laughs> well, why weren't you allowed to make art? <laughs> well, I, 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 think, I, know, I think I was five. I, I discovered, uh, do you all know red medicine or methylate, for those of you? <laughs> I discovered methylate, you know. And, well, I thought the color was the most You were brilliant. making art with it? <laughs> I, yeah, I, was, I completely decorated my room with it and painted the furniture and did things. And, and that, that didn't go over too well, but, um, but I knew I was into color. <laughs> <laughs> At an early yeah. age. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's uh, an artist who in, that you saw the work in Mexico that influenced you a great deal. So why don't you tell us about this artist? Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but I'm sure you are because you're so close to uh, Mexico here. Remedios Varo and uh, Leonora Carrington. Yeah, and him. we just lost Leonora Carrington, yes, just passed away. Yes, I know. Yeah. What was an end of an era, except for Dorothea Tanning. Um, but uh, I was very intrigued because it was a surrealism and also metaphysical uh, um, addressing the metaphysical in ways that I had never seen before. And uh, so I feel like it was some of the, some of the early touches on uh, magic realism. And um, I was a great fan of both of their works, but mostly I knew Remedios Varo. What, 
At what point in your life did you discover this work? I, I was in, uh, you know, high school mm -hmm. and uh, going into college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and where did you go to school, college? Uh, I went to the University of Arizona and then back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. To go to school in the University of the Americas. Now, um, at a certain point, you left Mexico and moved to Seattle. Yes, I did. What What took you to Seattle? Um, well, my husband was from that area, mm -hmm. and um, from Wenatchee, Washington, the Apple Capital. And uh, so we first moved to Portland, and then eventually I ended up going to Seattle. And the children and I, I uh, had two children, and we have two children. We lived on uh, Vashon Island. It was outside of Seattle. You have to take a ferry. It was quite rural, actually, the island. And, and um, were you, it was were you an making experience. art? Huh? Were you making art during that period? As much as I could, yes. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, two children, and um, my ex-husband had died uh, recently, so it, it was a lot to take care of as far as just raising the children. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I, I never stopped making art. It's just uh, showing art became, uh, you know, difficult mm -hmm. until later. Until well, let's look at some of the work you were making then. <laughs> well, before oh. we do that, though, I forgot. There's another yeah, there's trip some, here. That was yeah, there's another trip here, too. Uh -huh. Um, you went to India. Yes. And yeah. when was this? Uh, 1985, 1984, 1985, mm -hmm. six months. Tell us what, what drew you there and what you did there. Well, uh, you, the central figure there is Guru Nitya, Nitya Chaitanya Yati. And uh, he was a, a very revered teacher in South India, the last of the Dravidian um, lineage. And uh, I met him in 19, I think I was 28 or 29 when I first met him. And it was, I think I was 40 before I got to actually go to India. But he spent a lot of time in the United States and the West <coughs> Coast and teaching at the universities of Hawaii and Portland. So I became very interested in his, in his uh, approach to teaching, and, uh, which is mostly cerebral, really. Uh, there wasn't much activity going on as far as our bodies were concerned. But um, we didn't get up at 5.30 in the morning and do yoga, this kind of thing. But I wish we had. <laughs> but um, he was brilliant and a pundit, really, and a great writer, um, and translated the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata and the Sundalahara, which are all sacred books. So that's what we were studying is Vedanta, mm -hmm. actually. So it was a wonderful, wonderful time in India, yeah. And we, that's where we were staying, in this home in Uti, in Tamil mm. Nadu. Um, his main center, which is much bigger, is in uh, Kerala, uh, in the state of Kerala in southern India. Hmm. And tell us about the significance of these images. These images, um, the ones on the left, are uh, very early photographs of Aborigines dousing uh, I think of them as some of the first people on Earth that actually doused, because they are very, very early on, on Earth as well. And they used it for finding water and uh, their song lines, energy lines, and uh, food. And they would point a stick, or as you can see on the bottom, he's holding the other person up and pointing. So it, I, I w became very intrigued with dousing. Mm -hmm. And uh, dousing is uh, like water divining, you know. Um, and, of course, it can be used for a lot of things. So um, I was studying the early creation myths and uh, the elements. And this seemed to, you know, work along with finding some of the elements. You know, you could actually divine the elements. So that's what intrigued me as far as studying the early creation and myths. And where were you when you studied this? Uh, I was in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, was in this the after 80s. India? Uh, uh huh. I, I started dousing before I went to India, mm -hmm. and uh, I think in the 70s I actually started dousing. But uh, some of the, some of the, uh, I didn't become a member of the American Society of Dowsers until the 80s. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very cool stuff. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> where'd you go next, Susan? <laughs> and there's my particular dowsing rod, you know. I use the flame as the dowsing tool. This it's is called flame working, correct? And it is called flame working, yes. And this is where you learned it, right? Where you learned yes, how to flame work? Yes, and uh, I didn't really learn, yeah, yes, indeed. That's Pilchuk. Um, For those who aren't familiar, you want to tell the, yes. the audience a little bit about Pilchuk? Yeah. yeah. 
It's a it's an actual visual village of its own of glass of every possible <coughs> uh, technique that you could ever want to do is in Pilchuck Glass School. It's the only glass school of uh, of, it, of this kind in the in the world. So you have teachers from um, all over the world, and you also have students from all over the world. So I went as a student, and this is the flame working shop, which also translates into a drawing shop. And so they have sessions at that time, mostly sessions in the summer, and uh, anywhere from one week to two weeks. So I was a student, and then I became a um, TA, and then I started teaching there. And uh, it's an extraordinary experience because um, if you're using one particular um, material, you have every possible uh, new, any kind of thing that's new that's coming around from like Czechoslovakia or London. It's all there invisibly uh, available to all the students. It was quite a great experience there. If anybody, you know, they have this wonderful open house a couple of times a year. If you're in the area, it's really worth seeing. And it's about an hour and a half um, a high up in the mountain, so you can see a um, beautiful island of Kameno Island in the water uh, west, westwardly. So, yeah, and that's, uh, that's where the Mecca became, that's where glass became the Mecca in Seattle, was through Pilchuck, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and what's Chihuly's yeah, involvement, uh, Dale Chihuly's involvement with Pilchuck? You know, yeah, he was one of the people, you know, there were several people that mm -hmm. were early He's on, the best uh, known. Carpenter, yeah. uh, Huh? He's the best known, I would think. He's yeah. the best known, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Buster Simpson was um, a major influence in mm -hmm. it. And, uh, and, and John Hauberg, uh, Anne is, is one of my uh, collectors, uh, one of my pieces, a couple of my pieces. And she and her husband donated the um, land for, um, for Pilchuck. Oh. So it was a great beginning. At first, of course, it was just tents, you know, in the mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. and uh, now it's this incredibly beautiful campus. Mm. Tom, um, oh, I'm sorry, his name is, he, he's a great architect. Anyway. Well, anyway, let's move on and start looking at some of your, your early glass work. So you want to tell us about these uh, beautiful goblets? Yes, uh, I started making goblets as well as uh, candelabras. Uh, it was a way for me to earn a living as well while I was learning the glass in a more complex way. And um, the Corning Museum, uh, this, this is part of their collection now, and it's a ceremonial goblet. So it was actually a goblet for a wedding. You know, I made them for a wedding. Mm. And, um, but most of my work at that time was all about some sort of ceremonial something, and uh, including the candelabras and uh, they were either like menorahs or trees of life, um, and they a lot of times had stones and, um, yeah, related to somehow, and uh, Cher bought like, I don't know how many of them to create her own uh, altar space. Were these <laughs> goblets actually used in, in a wedding ceremony or in a ceremony before they became part of the collection? No, they were, they got, they were sold before uh, I was able to, I mean, to, yeah, no, somebody that for the museum rather so it didn't quite make it, but others have. Mm -hmm. Yes, others have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a little bit different design. And there on the left is the piece I was talking about that I could u I used to use malachite and um, whatever stones were available that seemed right for the piece. And on the right, this um, was several years later. Um, I the skill, my skill started evolving, and I could handle much larger work. And um, this piece on the right was, yeah, 37 inches. So it's quite heavy and uh, very complex and circular, you know, three dimensional. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your interest in the Tree of Life theme, because that seems to be recurring, and we see it here early on in your work. Yes. Well, you know, Mexico, coming from Mexico, uh, the folk traditions are, to me, incredible, have always influenced me as well, and uh, they, they have a great love for the Tree of Life, you know, in their, in, in their uh, pottery. Um, the craftsmen, um, you know, depict it in so many different ways, the Tree of Life. So I feel like that was very much imprinted in me as a, 
that's part of life, is your tree of life. You always have to have a tree of life. And, and it's, um, it's not something I consciously do. It just seems to be part of my, my you know, my language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's another tree of life, of course. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little more about um, how, you know, the process of, of flame working to make something as intricate as these? How much time does it take? Do you do it in, you know, one session? Does it take several sections? Is there a lot of refining that goes on? Yeah, but quite a bit, you know. It goes in, and, and this particular glass, which is uh, a scientific glass, it's what they, what gen generically you call, um, Pyrex glass, uh, but scientific glass is called borosilicate, and you use um, depending on the the, the, the size of the uh, glass. You know, it depends on the torch. So you make elements. You I make all the elements and put them aside and put them. I mean, in the kiln, and and anneal them, and then bring them out and start building it in sections. So you have to build it in sections because this particular glass, it's not like hot glass where you've got this hot glass, you know, where you're blowing glass and it's hot, 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 and you have to keep it really hot. This, on the other hand, you only have to keep certain areas hot. And um, if you happen to hit the flame with a certain, another area, you may crack the glass. So it's very complicated knowing how far you can go before you put it in the kiln. So you put it in the kiln and bring it out. So the piece on the left may have gone in the kiln at least ten times, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, before it was finalized, yeah. Hmm. Is, do you enjoy, I mean, what's it li the experience? Is it a therapeutic experience working on something that's this intricate? Well, um, I haven't done work this with this thick glass since 1996. Okay. So. Um, I can't relate to it now at all. Uh, well, I wouldn't go back to it. Uh, <laughs> too labor intensive then. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't really go along with my, I, I mean, I, and we'll get to it later right. too, but conceptually it, it was important for me to move on because mm -hmm. I was trying and to And I think that's important else. for every artist is, yeah. is to evolve and not sort of rest on the laurels, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. But I love doing this work, you know, it's mm -hmm. just a, yeah. And this is certainly a very different now aesthetic using found objects. Uh, can you tell us about this work? Yes, I, some of the sculpture that I have been working on, and at that point does have, did have uh, some found objects in it, and this is called Nada, Voz de Silencio, and the Sanskrit word for uh, Nada means um, all sound before it is perceived, and in Spanish it means nothing. So for me, it was about the stillness within and uh, the blown glass piece with the head that's been blown out um, is pretty much what I think of as a huge, some of our, you know, approach to becoming quiet or becoming in stillness. Is you sort of have to blow your mind to be able to get there. Do you meditate at all or anything like that? Um, Yes, I mean, I have been in the traditions of, mm -hmm. of um, different kinds of, different processes mm -hmm. from different, mo different uh, traditions, mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, but that, that, that body of work was, um, I think, uh, the Nitya, the guru, came and saw this body of work. So we had quite a great conversation around this concept of nada and um, the Sanskrit term. Because for me, then, it brings the knowledge that until we, you know, he was looking at it as though um, all sound that is perceived is up here, and that until it becomes part of the heart, it is not perceived. <laughs> so I thought that was quite beautiful, and, uh, and that conversation is actually taking place now in some of the work that I'm doing now, is uh, becoming connected to perceiving here and then realizing that the perceptions become form, you know, then it becomes form, yeah. Hmm. Another found object here, recycled ironing boards. I what think led it's you a good place for ironing boards. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how, how, what led you to the ironing board. I have not owned here. an ironing board since that time. 
<laughs> but of course, you've turned them into uh, into altars of sorts. You, uh, you want to tell us about the, this body of work? Then? Yes, I call the whole body of work uh, Our Lady of Moving Through Things. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I see this as uh, a lifetime, obviously, a lifetime uh, uh, search, you know, or quest, or just enjoyment. And, um, and it's going to be changing, I'm sure, now that, uh, you know, it's been 10 years, I guess, or however long. But the one on the left um, is, is silk roses that have been dipped in a particular kind of cement that is really fine. And uh, on the outside of the glass spokes, and that one is called Ish Una Hao, which means Lady One Being. And Ishel, which this is all, all about Ishel, really, the goddess Ishel, uh, was the first weaver of the Americas and uh, was considered a, a very, very potent deity in the Mayan uh, pantheon. Yeah. So, of course, they put her under the rug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, also, I love her because she's uh, all about healing, especially women in, in uh, pregnant women and women in childbirth. Um, she has 108 names or something close to that, similar to Ganesh. <laughs> so, you know, she works with transition as well as Ganesh does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the ones on the right, wait a minute. Yeah, the yeah. one on the right is um, uh, all candles, all these beautiful orange candles. And on the left, it's the red roses that have been dipped in wax. So each one had a different translation. And of course, they're in, in also influenced by the Virgen de Guadalupe. Yes. And this installation then comes out of those. Yes. One of the, uh, one of the names for uh, Ishel is called Our Lady Unique Inclination of the Night. She has the greatest names. <laughs> and uh, this was a, an installation for the Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek, whom David is familiar with and did a show there. Yes, I sent a rock and roll show there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had seen that. But anyway, it, was, um, it has uh, dragonflies um, stamped all the way around it because she's very connected to uh, the dragonfly as well. And that story will come up in a bit. And this one was, um, I, I brought this tray back from Mexico on one of my trips, and uh, it's one of these beautiful uh, hand-painted wooden trays. So I just cut the rays in there and made that as the, as the, um, the, the hair, the, the halo, and um, the blown glass rose. And then the rest of the roses are dipped in, in cement and sprayed with, uh, work sprayed with car paint. And this one uh, relates to the healing of the night, uh, this particular mm -hmm. uh, e-shell piece. And this is an installation that you did in Seattle, a uh, fairly ambitious installation. Then, com you know, as, as your work has evolved, you started working, I guess, in larger spaces. Yeah, well, this is way back in 92, so mm -hmm. I was uh, working in all these things at once. Mm -hmm. um, um, so uh, this piece was called Sacred Garden, an Invocation to the Heart. And, and this is actually about my experience between, or my feeling, a sense of the difference between the East and the West and the perception of... Um, how we perceive uh, knowledge, and in the in in the East, the Kundalini is the actual snake. It's the snake, and uh, and that is our spine, and that's where all our information comes for raising consciousness, and the chakras, and in the um, in the West, the snake is seen as an evil, and um, pretty Garden much of Eden and all of that. The garden, yeah. the garden of Eden, the <laughs> yes. fall, you know. Yeah, exactly. And so I wanted to create a space. And conceptually, this all goes into the, the myth, myth around all that, both in the Kundalini and, uh, and, um, and what I'm talking about with the West and the Fall. So I created a space where I felt like the, the paradox could exist. It's a safe place to experience both, uh, both of that. And um, I feel, you know, that understanding uh, 
the difference in, in the diversity in cultural thing. It was a, an important information for me to, to start working with in my early uh, um, installations. And what about the materials you used for this? The glass um, is 59 inches, the glass wall. You walked into the installation that way. So you had a, a really kind of tight spot to get into the garden. Mm -hmm. So I see this also as a celestial garden because it's, a, it's the Herculean journey around. Mm. So, um, and this is, um, they're, half, they're one inch uh, rods of glass. So that, that is an 18 foot glass wall mm. that is incredibly, it weighs, I can't tell you. So I don't even know how it was able to stand up with those thin rods. It was a, um, a really good friend of mine um, designed the actual metalwork and did the metalwork for me. Then uh, the, the oranges there are the tetrahedra of oranges, you know, um, and then the disc is made uh, out of enamel. It's an enamel, fired enamel that they had that artists could come in and experience and, I mean, uh, experiment with. And uh, it was fabulous. You know, you could put a Volkswagen in that place. And uh, it's a similar kind of fired enamel that your stove or refrigerator. So it, it was incredible. I mean, you know, you could do s screen, you know, after about six months, then that ended. You couldn't go do that anymore. <laughs> so um, I wrote to um, Jocelyn Godwin, who has written several books on sound, sacred sound, and a, a Robert Flood book, and asked him if I could use some images from Robert Flood, and uh, who was a 17th century physician and philosopher. And I'm a great fan of his, too. So that's what's on the disc. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think we have some more images from it. Yeah, and this is one uh, that was an um, um, installation that went up a few months later. And um, yeah, it's called Falling Bodies Taking Flight. So this is a much more lyrical aspect, even though bringing in some of the same uh, materials. The oranges are now flying, are now hung from the ceiling. So there's movement there and this wonderful fragrance of that and sense of movement. And the... Um, uh, wood, the, I mean, the, the branches are made out of hazel tree branches and glass branches combined. Mm. And so it's a bit foreshortened. It was about a nine-foot uh, mound of, um, of branches. And then one wall was what I call the Milagro wall um, outside of the installation, which were these offerings and, um, that I made each one separately. And uh, it mimics the beehive. And so some of them have actual bees, images of bees or, and herbs, healing herbs. So people could buy the offerings for five, from $5. Some of them were bigger from 5 to $25 and um, take the offering home with them. Hmm. Yeah. And moving back to some of your glass work with other mediums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are uh, more, um, this was on going on about the same time I was doing uh, just a little bit later from those installations. Is there more symbolism in these than in the earlier work? Uh, as far as the glass work? Uh, the imagery, yeah. In the, in the far as the glass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I think the candelabras was always a way for me to earn a living while okay, I was doing this. Okay, but what about, for example, this?